torment. We're going to talk about torment. We're going to get a better understanding why. That's what happens in the fifth uh, trump that you're supposed to be familiar with. You've got to know how it's going down. Or you may be in the wrong place at the right time. So we're going to do a little study today. And we're going to understand just how far Satan can go and how far he can't go. And what you are to know from our Father's Word. Open your Bibles, if you would, to the great book of Luke. Chapter 16, you're all familiar with the rich man and Lazarus. And of course, Lazarus in the Greek is the equivalent of the Hebrew Eleazar, which was the good son priest of Aaron after God had to zap two others because they played around with strange fire. So this was Jesus' way of bringing the ministry of Eleazar, the true priest, true teachings, back into being. And you have to read it with understanding. Many times we read it, but it's better that you understand the full value. So, that's what we're going for this afternoon. You're all familiar with it. So we'll pick it up in verse 22 where they're already in the millennium A, the spiritual body, that is to say. Verse 22 of Luke 16. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. The word is Hades. He was ended up in Hades. You might, if you pay real close attention, you're going to learn where Hades is. Okay. Verse 23. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Now I want you to understand, here he is in Hades, in hell, but he can still see Abraham at the very throne. So we know this Hades is just across the abyss here. But there's one thing I want you to be, I want, I want you to learn a word. What is this torment? It's banaos in the Greek. Do you know what it means? It means touchstone. This is very, very important to you today. Do you know what a touchstone is? A touchstone is a stone that was originally used to test metal. In other words, it was a very, the best touchstones came from Lydia, which is, has, it's not important. It's kind of a black slatish or basalt. The words, the name of it in the Hebrew is practically basalt, which is the stone we call today. The Ten Commandments in Albuquerque are written on such a stone. But if you put a silver coin across it, bam, it'll tell you how much silver is in that coin by the market leaves. Or you can take a golden coin and run across that touchstone and the color or the market leaves will let you know approximately to the trained eye how much gold is actually in that metal. So it is a way of a saying. So this old boy, his torment is, he came up against the touchstone and guess what happened? He left the wrong mark. Now this is important. So a lot of people say, he's tormented. Oh, it must be hell there. No, he just flat didn't make it. He didn't have what it takes. He failed the mark. When his metal was tested, he couldn't cut it. That's his torment, was grief. So I don't want people getting all panicky, and oh, well, it's torment, it's terrible, this, that, and try to hold people by fear. You're going to hell and you're gonna to be tormented. No, you're going to hell because you don't make the mark, period. And the grief is worse than, in the first place, let me ask you a question. 
we've had so many hellfire and damnation preachers. If you're in a spiritual body, if you walk through a fire, a burning fire here, if we built one, do you think you'd be touched? Answer is no. You wouldn't even feel it. Because that body is in a different dimension whereby it couldn't feel it in the first place. So it's just a bunch of pokey that's been passed out to people where they hold God by fear and blame him as being the tormentor. All he did was pass judgment. They made their mark. He didn't. And guess what? They flunked. So we're going to be t dealing with this word touchstone quite a bit that is most always translated torment. And we're going to take a lot of the misunderstanding of hell and judgment and a few other things, how far Satan can go, and look at it exactly as it is because you're going to, most of you are going to live to see it. All of you are going to be there at the judgment, but I mean in this generation. So you need to be aware of it. So what he says is he was tormented because he didn't, when touching the touchstone, he failed. His mark wasn't up to it. And it was obvious. Now, um, okay, we pick up then with um, verse 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And of course, the word tormented as it is used here means I'm grieved. I'm really grieved. What water is it he wants? The living water, the truth, the water that Christ represents. It's a little too late, Charlie. You're leaving the wrong mark. I don't know. What kind of mark are you leaving? When you go up against the touchstone, what kind of mark? I mean, hey, you can't, the stone won't lie to you. If you're the real stuff, you'll leave the right mark. If you're not, sorry, Charlie. You missed the test. Because God has a touchstone. Verse 25. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. You lived it up. You didn't have time for anything but self. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And this word tormented here is odunao. Odunao. It's not, it is not, it is not, Bas annals, like touchstone. This word tormented, od unel, grieved. Grieved beyond what you can imagine grief is. That was what was tormenting him, was grief. So I want you to understand that. I don't want you to let people shake you up on your first cruise because there's nothing to fear in serving God. But it's a terrible thing to be grieved to the point of choking to death almost. By that I mean being smothered because of misteachings, malarkey put out by people, would-be so-called teachers. When you had the word all the time. You see, it's according to God's test as to what kind of mark you're going to leave on the touchstone. Not, not some man's opinion. And as I said, the touchstone never lies. When you're rubbed against it, your mark is there. Like it, grin and bear it, whatever the case, or be happy. Sorry, that's the way it is. And the proceeds from it, if you fail, is grief like you have never imagined. You know, sometimes think of tormented as oh, they're shooting brands of fire at him and he's hopscotching on hot coals. Uh-uh. It's in the heart. In the heart. There he can see God's throne. There he can see Abraham, the father of all nations. And he's already embraced and hugged poor old Lazarus who 
When he, when he was placed on that touchstone, he left the right mark. And God said, come on in. Come on in, boy. And here, this rich man looks, here's a gulf, like that black carpet there. There is no way you can cross that. Not during that period of time. Maybe if you learn a lesson, maybe in the millennium, when we start taking names and kicking dragons, somebody will wake up. Maybe they'll get tired enough of that grief. I want you to know that your father is not out every day trying to zap somebody. We do it to ourselves by being misled, by listening to wrong teachings, by not paying attention and focusing on God's word. You're going to be grieved if you don't. And there's no one to blame but self. For not absorbing this simple letter that God has written to you. So, oh, no. That's a grief that you don't want any part of, believe me. That's torment within yourself. Verse 26. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. It's there, permanent, for the, at least for that period. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. It's over, friend. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. There's no crossing it. There's a river there, a stream of water, a gulf. God don't want anyone without they pass the test. God doesn't want anyone that doesn't leave the correct mark. I don't know. You know, our lives are a mark on that touchstone. Think about it. Think about it. Wouldn't hurt you to pray about it. No, God doesn't want to torment some way in the way of torture. And the word, uh, the the um, the word basonus can some people translate it as torture, whereas instead of testing metal, they test people by throwing them on a rack. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a touchstone. A touchstone where these people left the wrong mark. They weren't fit for anything but the junk pile. There was no value whatsoever there in their lives. Think about it. Verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. At least he had a little compassion for his kinfolks. I would say there's hope there for the millennium. 28. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment, basonius, touchstone. So that when they come to this place to be rubbed on this touchstone, that they have the privilege and the opportunity to leave a decent mark that they don't end up as I have in this grieved place. A place of grief. 29. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. In other words, they've got this book. Beloved, you do too. You got it. They had it. They paid no attention whatsoever or they allowed someone to pull them off course. That can happen so easy if you start playing around with traditions. Christ never intended that his word be difficult for anyone. And true wisdom is to be able to simplify that that is difficult for some. Anyone can understand a touchstone. It's that simple. Look at the mark. Sorry, Charlie. You're no good. Your life wasn't much, was it? Bang. Into the scrap heap. Metal that's not fit. Well, as, as the Lord told him, your brothers have the same opportunity that Eleazar had. How about it? Are they going to read it or not? And then the old boy makes another plea. He says, 30. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, no, no. 
But if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Verse 31. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And of course Christ would. Christ rose from the dead after four, and spent 40 days walking with them, teaching, documenting that if you come up against the touchstone, is that really too much for him to ask of us? I think not. He sent us a letter, and it's not that hard to follow. Sure, there's sin in the world, and our flesh is weak, but what does repentance cost you? Nothing. But it cost him a life on that cross. And he did it because he loves you. He made it so easy that when you come up to that touchstone and leave your mark, is it 100%? Is it 90? How's my mark doing? Is it leaving the right kind of mark? Let's try, like, well, I classify myself as gold in my... Well, let's see what kind of mark you make. Wow. Do you classify yourself as gold? Well, we're looking pretty good. What have you? Okay, what I'm saying is, it's a thing of nature, and it works just as sure you can get a touchstone, and you can take a silver coin if they still made them, or if you haven't saved one, try it. That's how you line up with God's touchstone. And who is our rock? Hmm? Who is our cornerstone? For the Hebrew, the same word will carry cornerstone as touchstone. How are you going to do when you rub up against that cornerstone? Hmm? Think about it. No, nothing to fear. No pain. He's not going to jab you with a pitchfork or something like that, nor is he going to allow Satan to. It's your deeds. It's your metal. It's what you have done in your life. Did you care when people misled your people? Did you care when Satan would do your family as he tries to in every move? Then just a little bit of prayer will increase the value of your metal just like that. God likes that. Telling God you love him and meaning it. You're going to leave a better mark, friend. Because God loves it. It makes him real proud of you. And you'll be 100%. Well, well, I'm not perfect. No, I know you're not. But when you repent, Christ makes you perfect. For that little while until you do it again. Okay? We all do, don't we? We slip. We all mess up. But he will always forgive you. When you mean it. And get, bring your metal back up to content. It's called refining just a little bit if you know what I mean. Do you know how you refine silver to kind of get the, put the heat to it? Hmm? I don't know if any of you have been on the Bunsen burner lately or not of life. Right. It'll do it. Okay. But he'll, he'll, he'll make you much better, but he may require a little for it. All right. So it's important that you know and that you always check. And you may have to go a little deeper into the Greek than I even have recommended tools for you. But you can, you can trust me that you can do the research and find out if you go far enough, okay? Um, I, I believe, I'm not sure if Bullinger backs me up there in this 16th, but uh, trust me, it's not difficult to learn. The prime comes to... Banuyas, which is to say, touchstone. Never, God, you know, it does no good to put somebody on a rack because of what they've done. It's easier just to blot them out. We don't want to be bothered with them. That's what God's going to do with them, ultimately, in that lake of fire. Now, that's the New Testament. But Christ always, but always... Reports. He said, you have Moses. Where's Moses? Pentateuch, Old Testament. And the prophets, what did they say? They warned you, is what he's saying. Well, let's find out. 
okay? We've got the letter. It's not too late for you. Let's find out. Go with me to Jeremiah. We'll go to the prophet. Verse 7, blessed. Now this is the contrary. This is the reverse of that. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. God will, that's a guarantee. He will bless you. Verse 8, for he shall, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when he cometh. But her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Boy, that's, you know, that's what you want. That's what you pray for, is that you can be a blessing to your family, that you can be a blessing to those who come, that you come in contact with when you put your trust in God and in his word, in his letter, that you can help some poor miserable soul that's been misguided by false preachers, by giving them a little truth and let them know that God's not cruel. He's a father we can love because he loves you. He's not looking for someone to put away or torture. I, I don't know how somebody could serve a God like that. Our God is so tender. And that's all he wants from you is your love. Why someone wouldn't follow him? I find that difficult. Follow a, a man? Do you see a beggar trying to rip poor people off from their, even the disabled? They, they make no, they make, they're not unashamed the way they rip people off. God's not happy about it. Verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. Do you know that? The mind, this is your mind, is deceitful above all And uh, desperately wicked who can know it. It's sick to death is what that desperately wicked means. Just really sick to death. What? If you don't have God's blessings. What do you know in this world if you don't have God's blessings? If you don't have peace of mind, you listen to the news and it'll drive you bonkers. If you don't know which way it's going beforehand by having studied the prophets. I mean, it's bad out there. And yet it really isn't. God's in control. He's just letting Satan play with some minds which are, they're deceitful. Boy, you can twist them and turn them. Spin doctors, the glory liberals all over the place and, and people lapping it up like dogs. It's amazing. Boy, what a generation we live in. 10, you know what it puts me in mind of? Listen, I, the Lord, search the heart. I, I test it. I try the reins. That means your very emotions. Even to give every man according to his ways. I don't know. How are yours? How are you doing? I give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. And again, hey, you know, we came by that word where he said, I try the reins, the emotions. Do you know? I'll give you one guess what that word is. It's bacon. It's a touchstone again. I'm going to test you out. I'm going to check your okra. I'm going to see what you're made out of. I'm going to test you to see where your trust is. Is it in me, God says, or in some character? Are you easily deceived? Is your mind um, desperate enough that it'll grab hope from somewhere other than hope in God, which always pays his bills? who always blesses. It's a time like never before to stay focused, beloved. Do you know, you come to a meeting like this, it's a large meeting, there's gonna be crumbs served and a lot of them aren't fit for slop that you're gonna pick up. Did you hear what I said? You're gonna have people out on the side that you need to listen to me, I came here to preach and teach. I didn't invite them. And you're going to have junk. I mean pure, unadulterated junk in some cases. How's your test stone, uh, touchstone doing? Test stone will work. <laughs> test, whatever. Okay. 
I guess what I'm saying, I might as well take advantage of this opportunity. There's only two authorized meetings here at this meeting. That was this morning, and that's now, and that's the baptism. With the rest of it, you're on your own, okay? But I trust you because I've taught you well, I'm sure, I think. And you know garbage when you hear it, all right? And what do you do with garbage when you have a good garbage disposal? That is not to say that I, I'm tell, I warn you because there are people that no one will listen to, okay? They couldn't gather a crowd if they were giving out $100 bills. And they know that we're a loving people. So don't let them take advantage of your, especially if they come up and say, I'm putting together a bunch of name and addresses to start me a new ministry. Well, I don't know. It may be fun, but <laughs> it could be trouble too. Anyway, stay focused on God's word, not people, not this man or any other man. Be a student of God's word, not man's. That's my point, okay? Because the Lord is going to check you out, all right? And your blessings, do you understand that your blessings, not in heaven, but today, come from this equation, all right? How are you doing? It's real easy. Your touch, the touchstone works beautifully, all right? You can, you can tell by a, a family, I'm not going to pry into any family. That's your business. But boy, you can look your whole family over and you know how your touchstone's doing pretty quick. Uh, verse 11, here's what it amounts to. 11, as the partridge sitteth on eggs and hatcheth them not, so he that getteth riches and not by right, have you got that? That getteth riches and not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days and at his end shall be a fool. That's what these beggar ministries amount to. Now, I mean, this is being televised on national television, and you can see why I'm so loved <laughs> by the, the uh, ministers of this world. If they happen to be fake, they don't love, they don't think much of me. But hey, that's the way it, the touchstone calls it, okay? Let me explain. Do you know what a partridge does? She doesn't sit on her own eggs. You got that? She lets somebody else do the laying. And then she comes along and plays mama. And she hatches them. And they look at her and say, Oh, Lord God Almighty, what hath thou wrought here? I'm out of here now. And her fruit is gone by the wayside and joined back up with the ducklings where they're supposed to be. And the poor old partridge is just always trying to make it on somebody else's eggs. Does that come through? Isn't, doesn't God have a real neat way of putting things where, I mean, it just, the old touchstone just leaves the mark like it, lump it, there it is, right? Take it or leave it, all right? He has a nice way of teaching. A, uh, gl a glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. I want you to let that sink in. It's a glorious high throne. There is no throne higher than God's. God's throne is supreme. Don't you ever let anyone try to take his place. Don't ever let someone try to fill in. He is your father. Don't let someone rob you. Well, I never thought of myself as being that close to God. You're very close. You're his child. And boy, does he take care of his children that obey him, that love him. He keeps a close watch on those hearts and minds that he assays and finds that they love him unashamedly and honestly. And he loves to pour those blessings out. You see, he owns everything. He's not going to spoil you. I can't tell you that. You got to work for everything you get. You know? It's like, I, I suppose, I, and this will sound like, 
we're getting to be a very large ministry because he did it, okay? I, I mean very large. But we can't take, you can't take, it's all of us as a family, a many-membered family. But it's God's blessings because I guarantee you we're going to toe the mark. I guarantee you we're going to stay focused on his word. You're never going to see me teaching a bunch of junk. You're never going to see me teach a bunch of garbage. We're going to teach God's word so that we receive those blessings. And we're not going to start begging or anything. There was one old boy came to one of our meetings at Branson. He said, my Lord, don't they ever pass the hat here? You know, he said, what kind of church is this? Anyhow, he said, those other people that come here, there'll be a guy get up front and you'll say, I want 10 people down here that'll give $1,000 right now. Okay. He said, what, what kind of church do y'all have? Well, I think we've got the best because it belongs to God. All right. He don't pay me nothing because I don't take nothing. All right. So maybe y'all get what, you, what I'm worth. I don't know. <laughs> but be that as it may, all right? I just love teaching enough that that's the agreement I made with him, and I've never kicked back, and I'm not going to change. So you're never going to hear me teach anything but God's Word. So if you ever get tired of God's Word, you better go somewhere else, because that's all you'll ever get from here. And do you know something? I promise you... If you take it to heart, you'll always be blessed because, boy, does he bless this ministry. I mean, after all, he gave us you, didn't he? Wow, that's great. Y'all look good. I'm glad, I'm glad he gave you to us. You know what I mean. As, as fellow, as fellow uh, whatever you want to call yourselves. <laughs> Woo! I'm so, this Irishman has about had it, okay? It's... <laughs> The Irish is beginning to get wicked here, rough. Uh, that's, I better go back to the touchstone real quickly here. Anyway, his throne, and I don't want you to lose sight of that. That's going to come back up again very soon, his high throne. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Do you want to live then you'd better keep your touchstone in good shape. You better keep your record. All it takes is repentance. That's not asking much, beloved. Is repentance and love. Verse 14. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I will be saved, for thou art my praise. You can count on it. You know, you can't count on man. You know, if you followed me around, I'll use myself as an example, and I've learned and experienced never do this. But I would let you down sooner or later. We'd probably be out roofing one of my houses or yours, and uh, the hammer would miss, and, and oh, Lord, look at that thing. It's twice the size it was, and the nails turning purple. And you would hear me say, blessings. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Uh, you know, man is going to disappoint you, all right? God won't. God never will, okay? Fifteen. Behold, they say unto me, Where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. That means hit me with it. Oh, boy, are they going to get it. Oh, are they going to get it. Like, it doesn't amount to anything. You say the word, ah, oh, well, let it happen. If he, wants to, if he wants to zap me, zap it. Don't worry. Think of the rich man and that grief. That's genuine grief. You know, the Greek word where poor old uh, um, Judas was hanged can also be translated choked from grief. Grief is a hard thing. I don't think anything hurts like Grief can hurt. I really don't. I think it's the most painful thing in the world. It's just really hard out and out grief. And it's going to happen to a lot of people, beloved. Your family in some cases, maybe. So work as hard as you can. Not, not being a burden to them. Not losing your credibility. But in prayer. 
in setting the example. 16, as for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee, to follow after his footsteps. You shouldn't. Jeremiah didn't. That's what he's saying. Neither have I desired the woeful day. I haven't desired the day, even though they say hit me with it, to say, God, just show them. Yeah. That's, that's not good. We're supposed to help them. All right. Thou knowest that which come out of my lips was right before thee. Be not a terror unto me. Thou art my hope in the day of evil. That day of evil is coming, beloved. It's coming. Satan's going to be here. But we're going to find out what it is he can do and what he can't do. Let them be confounded that persecute me. And don't worry, he will. But let not me be confounded. Let them be dismayed. But let not me be dismayed. Bring upon them the day of evil and destroy them with double destruction. And they're going to get it. Sorry, that's just the way it is. Our Father is very fair. He tries us with the touchstone. And again, the Hebrew word can also carry cornerstone, touchstone. You know, and he is our cornerstone. He's the chief cornerstone. Let's go on to the 13th chapter of Zechariah, next to the last book in the Old Testament next to the last chapter of that particular book. If my memory serves me right, and it always does. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> we're coming down to pretty near where we're going to get a handle on this. Chapter 13 of the great book of Zechariah, verse 1. In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanliness. It's a healing fountain. It's the fountain of life. It is Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ. The fountain we spoke of this morning. I hope you notice how that lecture is dovetailing into this one. It is a, also a literal fountain. And it shall come to pass in that day. We're looking forward to that great day. Saith the Lord of hosts that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land and they shall no more be remembered, false teachers. And also I will cause the prophets, that's fake prophets, false prophets, and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. God's going to clean it up. What with? Touchstone. And I hope you're beginning to understand when he sets you as a bacon, con, coin, that tower is an assayer. You're supposed to take a part in it, okay? And it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, then his father and his mother that begat him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and his mother that begat him shall thrust him through when he prophesieth. Now, fake prophets are not going to make it. They're going to be judged first. That's why... I, you know what? If I taught something other than the Word of God, and if I didn't do my homework, I'd shake in my boots. Do you know what God feels about people that mislead His children? It's not pretty. I don't want to frighten anyone from planting seeds because plant all day long from the Word of God, but don't plant from any of Satan's works, or you'll get the works, all right? Okay? Teach God's word. For, and it shall come to pass in that day that the prophet shall be ashamed every one of his vision. When he hath prophesied, neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. They're going to try to hide the fact that they ever made a prophecy. You know, I'll tell you something, these so-called prophets. Isn't Jeremiah good enough for them, I wonder? Isaiah? Oh, I wonder if Daniel isn't good enough for them. They think they got to be a prophet? Uh, you know, I think in Mark chapter 13, God through the Son said, Behold, in the prophets I have foretold you all things. You don't need to know anything else other than what's written. Beware of those that claim to be prophets. 
Okay. But he shall say, I know I am no prophet. I am an husbandman for man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. I just an old country boy. I ain't saying that. <laughs> Whoa. I've been there. Six. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? It switches now to the son. Then he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Now you can kind of begin to pick up there. People want to be friends with Jesus, but they don't want to follow him. Rather than follow Jesus, they want to lead him. They want to be a little Jesus or something. Hey, you may smile, but do you know that I have at least two or three people that claim to be Jesus that write me all the time? They drop out along the way. I be the son of God and you will do this and you will do that or your ministry will be dried up. You know. You will do so and so or I will bring a curse on you. They've never got it done for some reason. <laughs> I mean, there's fruitcakes out there, friend. Let me tell you something. Whoa. Verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that in, is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. Well, you're the little ones. The shepherd was smitten. They crucified him to our advantage that now you can repent. Have you scattered? I hope not. I think not. I'm going to insist not that you've gathered back together as a band of students of his word that the Trials and tribulations of this world are as a passing, fleeting thing. God's word is true and sure. Always has been, it always shall be. Verse 8, And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die spiritually, not physically. Got it? But a third shall be left therein. Nine, sharpen up for me. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try. There's that word again. Bakum. I'm going to put them on the touchstone. All right. We're going to test their metal. Try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. Now, what did he say? All I have to do is rub them across the stone, the touchstone. You see, beloved, you know you're in the book of life. Now, what's written there about you, I don't know. I don't want to know. But everything you haven't repented of, it's there. It's in the book. Okay? That, in a sense, is part of your touchstone. So, I don't know what kind of mark do you leave in God's book. That's my question. He, he warns you over and over, I'm going to try you like metal. That's what bacon means. I'm going to test you. I'm going to test your stuff. It's a time that you want to regard his word with a high degree as you do. And in the simplicity in which it comes forth, follow it. Go to the book of Revelation chapter 9. That's why we've done all this. Is I want to teach you something from that chapter 9, which is the fifth trump, which you're supposed to know. This is a time of learning. This is the benchmark that we're in right now. Is to know and understand what Satan can and cannot do. What you're going to be up against. We've done all this study up to this point in this meeting for this purpose to come to this place. Chapter 9 in the great book of Revelations, verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and that's the fifth trump. And I saw a star fall from heaven upon the earth, and the, to him was given a key to the bottomless pit. In other words, you know the information that that star claiming to be the morning star is coming. Michael is going to put the boot to him. That's all right. Hey, uh, really get it on, you know. We're ready, hopefully, aren't we? Yes, of course we are. 
But we're not going to quit. We're not going to stop digging in his word and re, until he releases all that we need to know. Two, and he opened the bottomless pit and there rose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. In other words, it is an imitation to the return of the day of the Lord when he returns. He's so bright that everything else is dark. Satan's trying to do the same thing, only he's blowing smoke. Got it? But this isn't when it happens. It doesn't happen till the sixth trump. But you're supposed to lock all this away in your mind to come against the touchstone of life when he does show. Okay? Verse 3. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. You're all familiar with that. If you've ever studied with me, I think even in the Mark of the Beast, I think I go into that sting and how it, a scorpion doesn't have a stomach and he uses the skin for a stomach. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not, repeat, have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now when some of these people come up to you, there's going to be an atomic holocaust. Yes, sir, it's going to happen. It's in the Bible. That's not what that says. It says you can't hurt the green trees. You can't hurt anything. What happens if you, what happens on an island or a place if you release an atomic bomb? I mean, it strips it. Vegetation gets the bigger hit of anything. This is your documentation. There shall be no atomic holocaust. I've taught that for years and years, but uh, some of them still like to hold people buffier, I guess. Well, if they got nothing else, maybe they should. I don't know what. Anyway, verse 5, listen carefully. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Torment comes from within. This still is that same word, all right? It is that same Greek word from the base. Basanos. Okay, touchstone. So what's Satan going to be able to do to him? He can't touch him. He can't kill him. So he's going to put him against his touchstone. His little mark. How have you done? Now, let me ask you a question. If, you have, if, if you're one of God's elect, and if you're all set for the Holy Spirit to speak through you, and you come up against his touchstone, what kind of mark are you going to leave? I can tell you now, you're going to flunk. He's going to say, you are one of those. And you're going to say, thank you, Father, <laughs> that I am. All right? But the touchstone is even implied with him. He's not going to torture people. Get that through your mind real good. He's not out to torture people. He's out to cause a lot of grief if he gets a chance. But he is coming as an, as an educator. And again, torment comes from within a person. They do it to themselves. That's the very word by, by, by means to, to from within, to be, to touch that touchstone. I'm pretty sure that uh, the companion Bible Bullinger will back me up here in this ninth chapter on touchstone, okay? So uh, you got to go a little deeper into Hebrew to really understand the full value of the capstone, the touchstone, and everything as this basalt is utilized here and it's a beautiful beautiful thing so what is Satan going to do he's going to put you against his touchstone and I guarantee you you're going to flunk and that means you're going to be delivered up period but he can't hurt you he has orders he can't touch you do you know something else he doesn't want to 
He wants to convert you. Why? He likes a challenge like anyone else. You, I know you've all heard me. People say, well, what do you do if a Kenite comes into your group? <sighs> challenge. You know, you convert a Kenite. And that's like, no. Nah, one on the board. I mean, naturally, if you, if you fancy yourself as a pretty fair teacher or communicator, that's a challenge. Don't you, do you see where I'm coming from? All right. Satan's going to consider you a challenge. First of all, he knows you're made out of pretty good stuff because you haven't listened to him, all right? Boy, he likes people like that in his army. He'll go for you, okay? Now, look what happens here. Verse uh, 6. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it. Now, does it say there that Satan is killing men and they can't, he can't find them? No. That isn't what's written. Because of grief, men, when they realize what has happened, because in the sixth trump, when this plays out, when it plays down, when it goes down, a lot of them are going to wake up because of the efficiency with, within which the Holy Spirit will use you. You're that tower that he has set, tried, tested. You're going to do it. You're going to stand. You're going to leave the right mark to be against him. But I wanted you to see what this word torment, rather than getting your heckles up and fear in your heart, to see it for what it truly is. And to know it's going to give you no trouble and yet be a comfort to others to explain it. That we're not talking about a torture rack or anything of that nature. And besides, um, Satan is coming to conquer with love, he intends to use the exact opposite. They're seeking death. He's not trying to kill them and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. Now, we have always, from Jacob to Esau, we've had a pillar. We've had Jacob's stone. Let me see. I told you to be sure and make a note of God's high throne. What's under that? You know, it was in England for many years until he returns to claim it anew. What stone was under that? The stone, stone of scone. What is it doing under there? What is it good for? I hope you know now what it's good for. I hope you know now why that when Jacob rested upon it, it was opened the door to heaven and he could see the angels coming and going as a way that that stone, his pillar that has been carried by our people throughout the years and is such an important stone is symbolic of that touchstone. That's why men have laid their lives down to protect it, to take care of it. To carry it. It is that stone. Now turn with me in closing. Two more verses. To the tw last chapter of the great book of Revelation. That stone was in the wilderness. He said. Speak to the rock and water came forth. It is a black stone. It is not of the same ingredients as the Lydian stone. But it is still a touchstone. How are you going to match up when you stand before it? That's my point. Verse 20, chapter 22, verse 1, in closing. We're just about through and we're just about out of here. 22, and he showed me a pure river of water of life. I, I don't know, are you in that water? Are you? It comes from Christ. Clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. That stone will still be there, that touchstone. That water, which is spiritual water, shall still come forth. In the midst of the street of it and on either, si either side of the river was there the tree of life, that's Christ, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So there we have that stone. We have that stream. Ezekiel speaks of it. 
we have the capstone, the headstone, and the chief cornerstone. The, cor the stone of scone, overturned, overturned, and overturned, and when it's overturned again, it will go back to he to whom it belongs. And of course, that is Christ himself. I hope you have enjoyed this lecture on touchstone. We barely scratched the surface, beloved, of the meaning of it. I hope and my purpose was from that fifth trump is to take away the anxiety of torment. Oh, Lord, just goes all over you. There's nothing to be afraid of but fear itself. Who said that, Roosevelt? Anyway, that's what God said. We don't have to worry. We got everything under control. And your father is leading you. And keep it simple. Keep it in his word. Don't chase sensationalism. It'll end you up in the ditch every time. You get some knucklehead that says, there's got to be more to God's word than that simple little old touchstone. What can we do? Well, let's, let's dream up something. Let's have a vision. <gasps> oh, Lord, I had a vision about the stone. I've got rocks in my head. Um, <laughs> and there are people that will say, Whoa, yes, did you hear that? He's got rocks in his head. Oh, oh get spiritual when I hear that. <laughs> Think. You know, God gave you a head. Use it. Think and stay focused on God's word. Do not in this last stretch be misled by anyone. It's all written that you need. I have foretold you all things, he has said. So, I'll tell you what. I wonder how many of you are going to get a little piece of slate and start marking. If don't mark the same piece of gold too many times, okay? It kind of whittles away. <laughs> I jest in a way, but it is fascinating. It is, a, it is what, we, it, that was the assayer's office in old times before they had all the fancy stuff. God picked up on it. He used it. I think it's beautiful. I really do.